grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good morning. I am Pastor Megan Young, and it is so good to be worshiping with you here at the Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, in Tryon, North Carolina, an open and affirming congregation. Whether you are joining us for worship this morning, brave or fearful, full of belief or questioning, lost or found, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are most welcome here in this home of Christ friends, where we worship the God who welcomes us all. We are so glad to be worshiping together, and we invite you to let us know that you're worshiping with us. Say hi in the chat box or send us an email because we'd love to connect with you. And if you know of someone who could use a message of love and hope and justice on this day, we invite you to share this morning's worship with them. Like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Help us form and build community because it is together that we work and co-labor for the beloved community of God, working for love and justice, trusting in the Holy Spirit's guidance. And so let us worship this morning in a way that will continue far beyond this day and these walls. Let us remember to be the church, protect the environment, care for the poor, forgive often, reject racism, fight for the powerless, share earthly and spiritual resources, embrace diversity, love God, and enjoy this life. And now, let us pray together our call to worship. Holy One, we gather on this day. We come as we are seeking to bridge the gap, hoping to reach the generation. And so accept all we bring before you today. Accept our worship, we pray.
Lord God, we praise you for all you have done for us, for bridging gaps, for breaking traditions, for building bridges, for lifting the lowly, for humbling the mighty. We come before you knowing full well what it takes to be your people in the world, understanding the need to be tolerant and the call to be generous. Yet we are guilty of widening the chasms that separate us from you and from one another, of failing to encourage acceptance or knowledge what life is like for those whose story is very different to our own, forgiving us for drifting far from your will for us and for questioning your purpose and our place within it. Soothe our wounds and those of others we hurt with your gentle grace. Send us from here to listen and to love that your fractured world may begin to heal. Hear us as we pray as you have taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Chapters 19 through 32. The parables of Jesus, as told in Luke's gospel, are familiar stories told over and over again because we still need to hear them. So listen closely and then listen to some stories from our church members and friends. We are inviting folks to share their stories throughout Lent, so sign up if you have a story to share. This morning we will hear the parable of the rich man and Lazarus and reflect our, on our stories of upending, perspective changing, and approaching the truth. Now may the Spirit truth open to us the scriptures, speaking a holy word, meeting us in the living God. There was a certain rich man who clothed himself in purple and fine linen, and who feasted luxuriously every day. At his gate lay a certain poor man named Lazarus, who was covered with sores. Lazarus longed to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Instead, the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. While being tormented in the place of the dead, he looked up and saw Abraham at the distance with Lazarus by his side. He shouted, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I'm suffering in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, whereas Lazarus received terrible things. Now Lazarus is being comforted, and you are in great pain. Moreover, a great crevice has been fixed between us and you. Those who wish to cross over from here to you cannot. Neither can anyone cross from there to us. The rich man said, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. He needs to warn them so they don't come to this place of agony. 
Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They must listen to them. The rich man said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will change their hearts and lives. Abraham said, If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, then neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Good morning and greetings from Malang, East Java, Indonesia. My name is Charlotte Blackburn and I was a member of Trine Congregational when I was a young person. And I'm so happy to participate in worship weekly and I'm so happy to be able to share my story with you today. I've been in Indonesia for a little more than 10 years and I came here as a mission co-worker to teach English. And people often used to ask me, Charlotte, Charlotte, what do you miss the most? My answer never changed. My mother, my daughter, my church. <laughs> and I know people were probably like, mm, you're a mission coworker. Why are you missing church? And it's because I have a very special relationship with my church. When I think about the congregational church, I remember people, the brooches, the clouds. Reverend Krakowski. I grew up with Jim Jackson <laughs> and some of the people that are famous in Tryon. That's, my heart is there. When I think about church, I think about friends. I think about unconditional love. I think about feeling a part of something bigger than myself. My church in Charlotte where I was an elder and I sang in the choir. I always knew who would be in the kitchen whenever we were gonna have functions. That'd be me, washing dishes, cooking. I really miss church. I tried here to go to church. I tried and tried many different churches. Church here is really different. Um, church here is an insider's event. And perhaps it's that way in America too. Maybe that's part of something we need to think about today. Do we reach out to people that may not know where to go to church. It's hard. So I have been adjusting. For nine years I'm adjusting. I'm looking for a church. I'm looking for a community. I'm trying to figure out how to fit in when I'm an obvious outsider. But I live here. This is my community. It's my home. How can I participate? How can I fit in? What can I do? Finally, we had found an opportunity to work with a great group of scholars at a university here. I decided, hey, I found this great place. I can get my hair cut. I'm going to have my hair cut every month. We're going to work with this group of people every week. We're going to walk around town and enjoy town. We're going to go to the movies. Everything was looking great. I'm going to get a facial every month. And then do you know what happened? The pandemic. From what I can tell from my social media accounts, this pandemic really um, made a lot of people unhappy. But I had already experienced all of that. I've already missed my family. I've missed going to church in person. I have missed a lot of things. But one beautiful blessing and one gift that this pandemic has given me is the opportunity to participate in worship again with churches sharing their services online. I can sing hymns, I can listen to the organ, I can call and response. May the peace of our Lord be with you and also with you. It's so wonderful. So for the first time in 10 years, I saw all of my family at Thanksgiving, thanks to Zoom because we've all had to adjust. We've had to change our perspectives about what it means to be together. At Christmas, for the first time in 10 years, I was able to see all of my family at the same time, thanks to Zoom. And one of the other great things is that finally I can participate in church. I don't look at participating at church via 
YouTube or websites as some negative thing. Of course, I miss everybody. I miss being able to hug people and talk and laugh together. But thank goodness, because I was willing to change my perspective and watch church online, I can actually feel like I'm in church again. Thank you. God bless us all and keep us safe. Thank you for listening to my story. Take care. Will you please pray with me? Gracious and loving God, as we enter this time of meditation, we pray that you might open us up again in both fresh and familiar ways to your holy story of reversals and revolutionary love. And as you do, clear space in our hearts for your still speaking word, that it might weave its way that your beloved story might weave its way into our hearts and minds and souls. Holy Spirit, come. We are praying. We are listening. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. As some of you know, for our sacred conversations on faith and race gatherings, we are currently reading the book, Who Will Be a Witness? Igniting Activism for God's Justice, Love, and Deliverance by Drew G.I. Hart. It's worth reading the book, and you are always welcome to participate in our gatherings. But this week in reading the book, there was one section that brought to mind, at least for me, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Before we get into those sections in the book, Let's remember this parable. It's the only parable in Luke's gospel where a character is named. There's the Good Samaritan, the rich man, the woman who lost her coin, the shepherd, the prodigal son, there's an innkeeper, but we never find out their names. But Lazarus, a poor man, a man viewed as unclean, homeless, a beggar dressed in rags, surrounded by dogs who lick his sores, relegated to sitting outside the gates, desperate in his starving state for crumbs to fall from the tables of those who have. We find out his name, Lazarus, whose name means God helps. Lazarus, who, when he dies, doesn't even get a burial. It says in the absence of a burial, the angels came and carried him to Abraham's side. And then in contrast, we have the rich man. He's doing everything right. Roman law codified who was permitted to wear purple clothing because purple was a very expensive dye at the time. And this rich, rich man is dressed in purple and fine linen. He is respected, he is honored, he is important by, his, by the standards of his community and the Roman Empire. He lives in luxury, protected behind gates. And when he dies, his position in life affords him the honor and respect of a burial. These two men, Lazarus and the rich man, they are in such proximity to each other, but worlds apart. And it begs the question from us, who are we failing to see on the other side of the gate? Who are we failing to see that is in proximity to us? Who is our neighbor that we are overlooking? So this parable, Jesus is teaching it as part of a series of teachings on the importance of the prophets and the law, the scriptures, and how we interpret them. Look to the scriptures. Look at what they are truly saying. Look at the big context of it all, Jesus says time and time again. The law and the prophets, they are firmer, more durable than both heaven and earth. Look to them. Now the Pharisees, they are reading the Hebrew scriptures and they're looking at Deuteronomy 28 where they are seeing justification for their understanding of the prosperity gospel. 
Obey God and you will be blessed in war. Obey God and you will be blessed in the marketplace, in the field, and at home. Prosperity is a clear sign of God's favor. Mammon and God are linked. That's their interpretation. The rich man, therefore, must be religious and faithful, favored by God in a way that Lazarus just definitely is not. But Jesus, in contrast, offers a different theological interpretation of wealth and poverty. Jesus separates out God and mammon. Wealth isn't bad, but it's not necessarily a sign that God has favored you. Wealth isn't bad, but love of money, making it a false idol, a means of self-worth, well, that is bad. And so Jesus is looking at the whole of the scriptures and is coming away with an interpretation that alms and acts of charity out of their abundance, that's, that's not enough. But rather, the system needs to be reversed. The system needs to be flipped on end so the Lazaruses of this world won't live in such terrible suffering. Jesus teaches his disciples to understand Moses, the prophets, the commandments, to look to the writings as a whole. And Luke's gospel makes it clear that for all disciples of Jesus, wherever some eat and others do not eat, there the kingdom of God just doesn't exist. But when we are looking towards the Lazaruses, well, that's when the kingdom building work starts. Plain and simple. Upend the world's notion. Be part of building the kingdom. So the rich man, he finds himself suffering in Hades or Sheol and sees Lazarus prospering by Abraham's side. Clearly he recognizes Lazarus from all the times he stepped over him not leaving crumbs at the gate to his house. And so he wonders why this man, Lazarus, that he recognizes, why they find themselves in such different positions as compared to how they were on earth. And Abraham says, well, basically, you contributed to the terrible nature of Lazarus' life on earth by your actions and inactions. You are a good man, but you, you missed this one. You walked by him. You prospered. That wasn't the sin. The sin was essentially ignoring Lazarus at the gate, ignoring the king, kingdom building work. And so the rich man, he pleads for mercy, for Lazarus to be sent to warn his brothers. And Abraham essentially says, no. If they didn't listen to Moses, and the prophets, then neither will they be persuaded if someone raises from the dead. Abraham is saying, God sent you the message already. God has given you all the truth you need. All the help, all the prompts, it's there. So listen. You have a whole lifetime to listen, to try, to fail, to love, to imperfectly serve our God, to notice your neighbor, because at the very least, something must be done on earth to help the hungry, the homeless, and the helpless. We have a societal responsibility. Now, in Drew G.I. Hart's book, he describes two experiences of worship as a black man at a mostly white Christian college. The first, John Deere, a Jesuit priest, comes to preach at his college's campus shortly after 9-11. Deere is moving from reflections on Jesus' teachings to considering the world of violence that we live in. He's talking about our country's military role in Latin America, 
about protesting American nuclear weapons and about current wars of our nation. Hart remembers Deere going on about the president, the Iraq war, militarism, and the Christian ethic of peace, peacemaking, and nonviolence. Hart wrote that he leaned forward to hear Deere's message because he seemed to take Jesus so seriously. And that's when Drew Hart noticed something else happening. Hundreds of students engaged in a massive exodus of the chapel in protest of the sermon. Hart writes, I did not want understand why such a dramatic response was needed at that moment. Could we not sit through chapel for 30 minutes with someone speaking to us regardless of whether we agreed with them? Was this really the ultimate test of one's Christian faith? Was this moment the point at which one take, must take their stand? Was challenging us to love our enemies and put away vengeance, to be peacemakers and practice nonviolence, really so offensive that it could not be considered or tolerated. I had to grapple with Deere's challenge because it was rooted in the life of Jesus to whom I had committed my life. The second worship experience that Drew Hart writes about also took place in that chapel. This particular service was called Culture Shock and was led and planned by students of color. It was a diverse multicultural space where black leadership was centralized. On one occasion, a black pastor preached a sermon. It was not a cute racial reconciliation talk or a multicultural feel-good church talk. Instead, the preacher, Hart writes, described a hermeneutic that centralized oppressed people in relation to Israel throughout scripture and God's response and commitment of liberation to them, for them. Then drew parallels with the American way seen over the last 400 years. For this preacher, the United States, including the Republican and Democratic parties, was racist. And white Christians were deeply complicit at every stage. It was, as Hart described, not an ordinary chapel talk, but courageously truthful speech. And then Hart noticed that many, though not all, of his white peers started getting up and leaving. In Hart's words, the talk was apparently just too much. They had not come into chapel to hear white used in such a pejorative way. They had come to worship Jesus, white supremacy, white privilege, white Jesus, white complicity, white Christianity, they had signed up for none of this. And just as the speaker was making a biblical argument, cli climaxing in the life of Jesus, they left. The truth is so often hard for us to take. We really want to take Jesus that seriously. We step over him at the gate and proof text into existence our own comfort. We miss the Lazaruses. We miss the Moses, prophets, the scriptures. We sidestep the truths that God has been delivering to us all along, even when they are hard to swallow, as Abraham tells the rich man. We walk out when it's not convenient when the truth causes us to pause and reflect and change our perspective and brings about the realization that we might need to upend the way we are seeing things. 
There was a news clip this week of a famous TV presenter storming off set. After hours of spouting his opinion on, in, in sometimes incendiary ways. And what caused him to storm off was his colleague relatively calmly and somberly repeating and reflecting back to this presenter his actions of the last 24 hours, his words of the last 24 hours. It often seems that the truth is the thing that causes the most volatility. Not the difference of opinion or practice, but our words and actions repeated back to us. The truths that have been there all along. That's the hardest thing to hear. There's a sculpture by Dennis Oppenheim called A Device to Root Out Evil. It's a metal sculpture of New, a New England style church flipped upside down with its steeple buried in the ground. The original name for the sculpture was church, but apparently this was deemed too controversial. I'm not quite sure who thought a device to root out evil was a less controversial name, but it seems that this sculpture gathers controversy and has been relocated many times before it finally wound up in some park in Canada. Academically, I, I get the symbolism. I get why folks are offended or find it controversial. But I confess spiritually, there is something that I deeply appreciate about this sculpture and both of its names. Because church, the church that takes Jesus so deeply seriously, the church that is rooted in the life of Jesus, that draws our attention to Moses and the prophets and the law and the whole of scripture, that kind of faith, it should flip us upside down. It should flip the church upside down to shake us up and reorient our perspective when we become complacent in systems that harm and hurt our neighbors, when we become complacent in systems of evil that overlook the Lazaruses of this world, the Lazaruses in our own lives. Church, our faith, the scriptures, it should upend us in beautiful, challenging, and life-giving ways. Confronting truths, confronting what we have overlooked, that's hard work. But I pray that we might have the courage with God's help and the Spirit's guidance to change our perspective, to flip onto our head some days, to face what needs facing, and take Jesus so very seriously. So may you find some time this week to change the way that you're looking at things, to try on a new perspective and rediscover who God has called you to be in this work of kingdom building. Amen.
As a community, we walk with each other through life's milestones, and we like to mark those moments, blessing each other on birthdays and anniversaries. And so first, if you have a birthday in this month of March, I invite you to receive this blessing. Let us pray. God of all creation, we offer you grateful praise for the gift of life. Hear the prayers for your beloved children who recall today the day of their birth and rejoice in your gifts of life and love, family and friends. Bless each of them with your presence and surround them with your love that they may enjoy many happy years, all of them pleasing to you. We ask this through Christ our Savior. Amen. And if you are celebrating an anniversary of any kind in this month of March, we also invite you now to receive this blessing. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for these couples and for all the years that they have had together. Today, as we celebrate their anniversaries, our prayer is that you will continue to bless them. Send therefore your blessing upon these, your servants, that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in full faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, as we continue into our time of prayer, we bring our joys, our worries, our concern, gratitude, our hopes for ourselves, our neighbors, our friends, families, community, and the world. We come because God invited us to bring it all in prayer. And we come because we believe prayer has the power to rise up against the disorder of this world. So let us now join our hearts together. A living and loving God, where there is division between countries, communities, neighbors, families. Lord God, heal the rift with understanding. Where war dismisses peace, radicalism defies tolerance, the guilty target the innocent, abuse exploits the abused. Lord God, enter the abyss with love. When the refuge is rejected, lies are presented as truth, trust is betrayed, children are forced to grow old too soon. Lord God, be a bridge of hope. When we are more accusing than forgiving, more judgmental than accepting, more hurtful than helpful, more proud than humble, Lord God, Mend us and make us worthy in your service. O oh God, we hold each other in prayer, bringing you our prayers for the people and situations we know where your help is needed. And so with thanksgiving for all that you have done, we bring to you now, O oh God, our prayers that sit on our hearts and minds, our prayers for ourselves, our neighbors, and all of your creation. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us and shape our lives according to our prayers. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. The time of offering is a moment to reflect on the blessings we have received from God and the ways that we, through our time, our talent, and our treasure, can return thanks to God and be a blessing. And so I want to remind you that today is one great hour of sharing. We are joining with congregations throughout the United Church of Christ to collect a special mission offering to be used in places lacking health and educational resources and or where disaster has struck. By joining our resources together, 
we as Christ's body partake in a common witness and make a collective positive impact where critical human needs exist. As a reminder, you can participate in one great hour of sharing by giving through our online giving platform and selecting one great hour of sharing in the pull down menu uh, where you specify where you're giving. Or you can mail a check to the church. Just be sure to put in the notation line that it is for this offering. In our generosity, we recognize that we are all part of God's family. In our giving, we dare to imagine that God will use our gifts in the world to do great things, more than we can imagine. So let us now give generously. When it comes, everything changes. Children can go to school. Women can start businesses to help support their families. Crops can grow. Neighbors can take care of each other. Markets can thrive. Families can be families. When water comes to a village, everything changes. Water is essential to life and the life of a village. We are giving makes projects like new wealth in villages possible. Give to one great hour of sharing and let love flow. Lord God, we may not be rich, we may not be poor, we may not be as faithful as you would wish us to be, but we and the gifts we offer today are yours. Bless them that they may reach the people and the places most in need. Bless us that in our service we may define boundaries to meet you on the other side. And let the people of God say together, Amen.
as we prepare to continue our worship out in the world, I invite you to take a moment to remember the peace Jesus shared with us. It isn't easy or half-hearted or insignificant. It can pierce our most terrifying moments. It can transform strangers into friends. It is the peace that surpasses all understanding. So may that peace be with you and be shared by you in all that you do. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And now as we go from this place, May we tighten the laces of our shoes and walk out together to be a friend to the friendless, to share what we have with those who have nothing, to love those who have forgotten what love feels like. And may God's love, Christ's call, and the Spirit's inspiration be with you in this journey and for all eternity. Amen, and go now in peace to love and serve our God.